Welcome all to our third session in the mainstream webinar series, Striving Towards Success in Mainstream Schools. We are very grateful that Butte Creek Foundation supports our webinars and the efforts that go into um, developing the webinar, producing it, and then posting it on YouTube for any and all to access freely. Today's webinar will be presented in English and tomorrow's will be presented in Hindi. If you would like to come back, you are most welcome. If you have friends, families, colleagues who would like to listen to this information in Hindi, please share the link with them to join tomorrow or they can contact me directly. So for the past multiple months, past three months, we've been talking about mainstreaming. Um, and we've talked about how to choose a school for a child, how to know if the child is ready for school. And you can watch our previous webinars on the Listening Together YouTube channel. We've talked about five steps for partnering with schools, how to give information, how to advocate for support, and how to build a team around the child. That webinar is also available. And the webinar from last month, which I think was a big hit, about access to form and signal, access to meaning at the school age level, the importance of language of academics is also available to view. So today we are going to continue on the theme of academics and language and support and talk about um, how do we make sure that children have the right support? Okay, so you saw this chart last time. And as you can see, the needs of children change over time. What is highlighted here are areas that children who are deaf or hard of hearing might need help with. How can we ensure, sorry, I'm just gonna turn on the transcript. How can we ensure that children who receive these, that children will receive these supports? How can we figure out who will provide them when and where? So just a quick note, the areas you see on this slide, as I've said before, are areas that are likely to be impacted by hearing loss. Not that every child who is deaf or hard of hearing will struggle with this, but these are areas that are vulnerable or that could be considered fragile, okay? So keep that in mind. There has been a request for this graphic to be available and I'm gonna get it done and available for download and use any way you see fit in your conversations with families and other professionals in a few days. So type in chat. If you are a parent, think about your child. If you are a professional, think about the children you work with. Does your child or student have IEPs? Do you participate in IEP meetings for your child or student? And are individualized education programs or plans, IEPs, a part of the special education law where you live? So you can just say, yes, 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 no, no, no. However, that works. I'll wait a second, I'll drink some water. Okay, some, so some variation. Some have said yes to all, some have said no to all. Some have said yes, yes, no, which is very interesting to me that it's not a part of the special education law, but it is still being offered. That's pretty cool. But you know, if not being legally binding is a challenge. Oops. All right, okay. So I'm assuming we are going to see some variation in um, what this document looks like. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to present to you how I understand IEPs as developed in the US education system. 
I'm going to spend very little time talking about it. But then I'm going to talk to you about how can we take this approach to planning and implementing individualized intervention into the world, even if it's not part of the law. All right, so I'm hoping that you will take from this not, oh, this is what happens in the US, but oh, here is a way to do this, okay? So according to the Department of Education, Individuals with Disabilities Act, an IEP is a written statement for each child with a disability that is developed, reviewed, and revised in a meeting in accordance with name of the law, and it must include present level of achievement, measurable annual goals, description of child's progress, special education and related services, participation in general education, accommodations and modifications. All right. That's the legal language. Let's go with what we mean by all of that, okay? So fundamentally, what's the purpose of an IEP? Why do we want an individualized education program or plan for a child who is deaf or hard of hearing? We want to understand areas of strengths and needs. And if there are needs, we want to develop a plan so that the child can catch up. We want to work as a team to develop this plan because hearing loss impacts multiple areas of development. And if we have experts and specialists in each of these areas, with the parent being the expert on the child, then we can work as a team to develop this plan. The purpose of an IEP is to identify goals and who can help the child with the goals. And we'll talk more about this. The purpose of an IEP, at least in the US, is to identify what type of educational environment best suits the child. I think this could be a goal anywhere in the world, but it is required by law in the US. So I just wanted to clarify that. And identify any changes that need to be made to the environment to support the child. And these are typically the accommodations and modifications. I'll give you a second, think about it, read the slide. Write down any thoughts. If you have comments, put it in the chat. If you have questions, put it in the Q&A. If this makes sense, give me a thumbs up using the reactions buttons. All right, makes sense. If anybody wants to take a picture of this slide, this is a good time to do so. All right. So when developing an IEP, whether it is required by law or not, here are some questions to consider. This is how the IEP form is laid out. And I am not going into those details because the form looks different depending on where you are. The form in California looks different than the form in Illinois, which looks different than the form in Florida. So let's forget about the forms. And the forms in India look even more different. Um, but what I want to do is just think about how do we think about developing IEPs? What are the questions we need to ask? Always, 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 we start with the strengths and the current performance. 
what is the student doing right now what is the child doing right now traditionally an iep is for children 3 and older because in the us children under the age of 3 a similar kind of thinking happens using an individualized family service plan but if you are in a country where that is not the norm same questions for children under 3 okay what are the child's strengths and current level of performance the answer to this can be something like i'm going to use the the name maya to you in in all of these examples so maya is a 5 year old who is curious and enjoys art she loves playing dress up and loves to be social currently maya speaks using two to four word sentences communicating basic needs and wants for example want banana more milk wear ball these are some two word utterances i'm all done time to go bye bye are some examples of phrases i want the red one can i have blue please are some examples of the three four word utterances but it's essentially needs and wants so okay so that's where what the student strengths are and this is what she's currently doing in the area of language and communication and we're just going to think about that okay as an example throughout what are the students needs so if maya is 5 and speaking like this what are the areas where she might be a little bit behind what are the areas that she needs help with clearly expanding language and vocabulary is a key area so the student needs to continue to expand vocabulary and develop language that is age appropriate which in this case would mean compound sentences and the beginning of complex sentences so you would say maya needs to continue to develop vocabulary that she uses at home and school she needs to learn to use longer sentences um that include pronouns and verbs and adverbs and conjunctions and prepositions so that is a need okay so if that is a need what are the goals we want to do in a year 12 months that's typically how ieps go they are written for a 12 month period so if we write one today september 10th 2022 that iep will be good till september 9th 2023 and the team would have to get together to discuss next steps before september 9th 2023 So knowing that Maya's needs are in the area of vocabulary and syntax, what are the goals we want to achieve? One example could be, you know, I mean, we're going to write a big goal. Maya will expand vocabulary and use more compound and complex sentences in spontaneous spoken language. But that's like a general goal. How can we be specific and measurable in these goals? so one example could be you could say over the next 3 months maya will learn maya will use and understand 100 new words a variety of nouns verbs adjectives adverbs and use them in spontaneous language with 80% accuracy so everybody on maya teams know team knows that learning new words is a goal is a target is a priority and we need to know if she's learning them because we say 80% accuracy so we have to keep data on it as we are thinking about all of this one of the most important things to consider is how does the student's disability hearing loss impact 
involvement and progress in the general education curriculum. Now, if you attended our session last month, we talked about access, right? If a child can hear but not understand, then they don't have access to the curriculum, which means they are going to need support. Maybe some pre-teaching, maybe some vocabulary development, maybe some literacy development. But you have to talk about that. You have to think about that. I know students whose hearing loss does not impact their ability to participate. Their language scores are amazing. Their listening skills are incredible. Their speech skills are age appropriate. They are reading, writing, performing at an age appropriate level. And thus, they don't get a lot of goals or supports or services. They are doing well, so they will only get monitoring. Once we have thought about where the student is right now, where do we want to go? How will we get there specifically? We have to think about the who. Who will help the student get there? If the need is in the area of speech articulation, how to say the sounds correctly, maybe it's a speech language pathologist. If the need is in the area of language development, it could be a speech language pathologist or a teacher of deaf and hard of hearing student. If it's a reading deficit or delay, it could be a teacher of the deaf and hard of hearing and a reading specialist who's gonna provide additional supports. Sometimes it's a special education teacher who has training in working with children who are deaf and hard of hearing. So the who changes based on the goal. Sometimes parents will say to me, um, you know, my child needs to work with a speech language pathologist. And I'm like, why? Your child doesn't have any speech needs and all language needs are academic language. They should be working with the teacher of the deaf. And the parent says, no, but we wrote language goals. And I'm like, I hear you, but we have to think about who can teach the goals that have been identified which are identified based on strengths and needs, which is why that's the first question to think. Where is the child today? Where are we going? What do we need to do? Who can help us get there? And then finally, you have to think about when and where. I was once at an IEP where the child had a lot of goals. There was a lot of delay and there was a lot of catching up to do. And we identified who would work with the child. The child had multiple speech errors and there was a lot of speech work that needed to be done. And the administrator said, yeah, okay, we'll do 15 minutes of speech a day, uh, a week. And we were like, um, if we just wrote eight goals, 15 minutes of speech a week, in a 180 day school calendar is not gonna help us meet these goals. So the when and where does not match the goals we have written. The point I'm making is there are two things that really guide an IEP. Where is the child now? Where do we want to go and what are the goals? Everything else falls into alignment with these two, two pieces. Parents in the room, I really want you to listen to this and think about if your child has an IEP, has there been a clear understanding of needs and goals? And then the rest of it has been planned. If you are a professional listening to this, think about when I think about an IEP, is this what I'm thinking? Is this how I'm thinking about it? So as schools offer special education services, which I'm finding out is a popular phrase to throw out there. Oh yes, our school has special education services. If you're a private school or a private school in India, um, ask them what that means. What does that mean? How will you provide special education services? How will you determine what special education services are needed. Okay, that was a lot of information. 
I'll give you a couple seconds to think about it. Type in chat, ask any questions. All right, let's talk about how NIEP is developed. So we talked about the what, let's talk about the how. All right, we are going to develop an IEP for this child. How? With a team, that's step one. Nobody can just write an IEP document and send it home. Within the law, outside the law, I don't care. If we are doing an IEP, it needs to be at least one professional and the parents. You cannot do an individualized education program without parent input. And once the child is old enough, by law in the US, 14 and a half, with the child's input. When we develop an IEP, we are taking into account the student's needs, but then we also have to take into account what do we need to do to help the child catch up if the child is behind? When we are developing an IEP, we have to remember that we are making a plan for the student, but we can change it at any point based on the student's progress or lack of progress. I remember like this is mid 2007, eight, nine. At that point, the, the kids that I was working with where I was, kids were starting to get a second implant. That was the beginning in the field of, oh, just one implant isn't enough, they should have two. So many of the students I was working with already had one implant and then they were getting the second one. So we were writing audition goals, listing goals, for these students and you know, with the new implant, the child will detect, discriminate, identify. And some of these children were making progress so quickly that what we thought would take six months, maybe it took two months, then what? I'm not just gonna sit there. We changed the IEP to bump it up to a higher goal so we could help the child catch up. Sometimes you make a plan. Maya will learn 100 words, but maybe 100 words is not working out. Maybe she's only learning 50 words in three months, which is okay, but not gonna help us catch up. So then we meet again. Why is she only learning 50 words in three months? Do we need more time to focus on the words? Do we need um, a different type of list? Do we need a different type of approach to teaching the words? And you revisit this. Know that an IEP is a legal document, at least in the US. I know other countries don't have the same protection, but I think if the team is committed to seeing it as an important document, you don't need the legal backing. Because here, even in the US, even though it's a legal document, not everything written in an IEP actually happens. You need buy-in and support from the team for the IEP to be effective. And then finally, and this is probably the most important piece, what is discussed at an IEP and how it is discussed, right, in collaboration is what makes a, a meeting an IEP meeting, not who is at the meeting. Sure, you can have a meeting with the parents and the professionals and the parents don't get to say anything and only one professional is saying and doing everything. That's not a real IEP meeting. That's just a one person telling others what to do. Okay, so, so keep in mind that while we want a strong IEP, how it is developed will contribute to its strength. If there are any comments, type in chat. If there are any questions, type in the Q&A. Okay, 
I added these slides this morning. So I am very open to any feedback and thoughts and ideas from everyone in the group. There are many documents available here in the US that talks about the roles and responsibilities of parents in an IEP meeting. I know that not everybody has the same um, setup, educational setup to have those roles and responsibilities. So this is what I propose the role of the parent or the caregiver can be in any setting, in, in, whether there is a law or not. The first thing, unfortunately, for some of you might be the parent has to initiate the meeting. The parent might have to say, you know, I want to talk about my child's educational plan, how my child is learning in the classroom and what goals we have in addition to the syllabus that we are working on. That might be the, the probably the hardest first step for some families. When we have that meeting, attend the meeting and show up as the expert on the child. You might not be an expert on language development or reading development or speech or anything else, but you as the parent are the expert on the child. You see the child, you live with the child, you work with the child, you help them do homework. You know what's going well, you know what's not going well. You are the expert on your child. And I, I'm saying parent, I'm not saying mother, because this is any and all parents and caregivers involved with the child show up with expertise in various areas. The parent or caregiver at this meeting should be able to share your hopes and concerns for the child and their progress. And then if this is actually a meeting where goals are being discussed, think about the proposed goals. Just because a teacher said, let's do this, I don't know if that's something you just have to accept. Think about the proposed goals and think, Will they help the child make progress? Will they help my child catch up? And maybe you don't know the answer to this, right? It's totally okay to say, tell me how we will know that the child is making progress. Tell me how this will help my child catch up. Why did you choose this goal? I realize I'm saying things that parents might not feel they have the power or the authority to say. But if this is the goal, what are the sub-steps? What, what is the path towards getting to this point? If you are looking for a school for your child, keep this in mind. Is this a school that's gonna work with you on these kinds of conversations? Is this a school that's gonna be open to this type of interaction. The role of the professional and program leaders, this is not just the role of one professional, but everyone involved, is to establish a process for conducting effective IEPs. If you are in a place where IEPs are not something that is routine or part of the law, please reach out to us. This thing together would be excited to help you develop a protocol for IEPs. Having done this for 20 plus years, I know that IEPs can serve as a really beautiful roadmap to helping children achieve their full potential and having support, even if it's just in a center or a clinic set up and not in a mainstream school. So if you don't have a process in place and are interested in learning more about it, if there is enough interest, we can do a small workshop with all interested parties. Let me know, put it in the survey. A key aspect of what the professional contributes to the IEP process is having good, accurate assessment of the child's present levels and performance. How is the child doing in the area of listening and speech and vocabulary and connected language and literacy and academics, social skills and self-advocacy? 
all of these areas have to be considered. In the US, there is another um, section called functional or, or, or called communication. And then another one is called functional performance. This is, can the child bring their backpack to the classroom by themselves, take out their books, put away, like if they're changing rooms, can they go from one room to the other? Functionally, how are they doing? But at least these eight areas, right? Because you might not see the child in all settings, but these eight areas should be um, assessed periodically by teachers in special education or therapists in special education schools, teachers or therapists at the center or clinic level, as well as teachers in general education setting. Once you have identified the assessments, identifying the specific measurable goals for six to 12 months at a time that will help the child close the gap is another important aspect. Once these goals are developed, proposing these goals to the team and figuring out who, how, when, where, we will work on this is important. Again, I'm giving these broad ideas of what parents and professionals can do. So really be thinking about your setting and what is possible for you. I am happy to have conversations with anyone who wants to explore this idea further for their setup, for their school, for their clinic, for their center. So some general thoughts. Right, Like I said, even if IPs are not a part of the law where you live, consider using it as an approach to planning and implementing intervention. You can use IEPs as an approach in pre and post implant rehabilitation. You can use IEPs in special education schools, right? Why are kids in special education schools? The goal almost always is they are gonna mainstream. How are we going to get them from today to the time they mainstream? If the child is in a general education setting and doesn't need a lot of support, there is still the idea of a learning plan where you are figuring out what is the pre-teaching needed? What is the assistive technology needed? Is there need for self-advocacy skills? And I can imagine that for some of you, you might be thinking, oh, wouldn't it be so good if this was just available to us? It would be. But I want to remind you that before 1975, IPs were not a part of the law in the US. Children were not, did not have the right to an education with non-disabled peers. There were no IEPs. Parent involvement was not required by law. Parents, professionals, and policymakers had to work together to bring about this change. I think right now in India, and I'm saying India because that's where a majority of our audience is from, between the national education policy in 2020, the Rights of Persons with Disabilities Act and the revision in 2016, the Right to Education Act in 2009, I think we are moving in that direction. Taking the next step, building on the laws that exist to create this level of support, to create this level of inclusion is what each and every one of you can contribute to. So my call to action today for all of you is, what are you taking away from this webinar, from this information? What is the change you want to make? Maybe just for yourself, maybe for your center, maybe for your you know, city, maybe for the whole world. Maybe you are someone who can influence policy. And really think about how will you create ripples of change in your community? What is it that you need to do to bring about change? And of course, how can we help you bring about that change? That is a, a core belief at Listening Together. We are here to support people who take on leadership roles to bring about change that helps children who are deaf and hard of hearing around the world. We are here to support and share what we know. 
it's just a matter of you reaching out to us and telling us what you would like help with. All right, that's all the content for today. I am quite amazed with myself that I actually finished at the 40-ish minute mark. So time for question answers. I see a question, I'm gonna answer it live. There's a question. Once a 12 month IP is in place, a weekly report for the same is required or how do you go about it? So um, the rule in the US is that you have to provide a report once every three months at least. Sometimes if it's a skill that is developing pretty rapidly, so for example, if it's a kid who has a new implant and we are working on detection, I would keep daily reports on how they respond to the link six sound. If this is a kid where we are working on vocabulary, I will probably keep weekly reports. If this is a kid that, um, this is a language goal, right? A language sample every three months, so every 12 weeks will be important. In the form that is used in the state of Illinois where I live, you actually have to specify how often you will do reports, daily, weekly, quarterly, monthly, quarterly. So that is part of the discussion in this. I hope that answers your question. Other questions, comments, thoughts? I like this summary that just came up in the chat. IPs are like roadmaps. Every professional should follow it, reassess it, love it, and monitor the progress to make their child reach the desired destination. Absolutely. It is considered a blueprint, a roadmap towards achieving goals. Well said. I want to hear what are you going to do with this information? Or are you just gonna say, oh, that was a good talk. Lots to think about. I wanna know what are you going to do with this information? What is the action plan? All right, if there are no other questions or comments, I'm gonna stop right here. Um, I'm gonna stop the recording right here. You can reach out to us if you would like. All right, um, I see some questions, I'll answer them, but I'm gonna stop the recording right here.